Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the um, invite and the opportunity to um, um, share some of the work I do. It's good to be back in Roma, catching up with the, uh, uh, a few people. I'm going to talk about the area of social licence, which I'll explain, but to talk about the area we work in, in terms of the relationship between uh, food and people and a whole range of issues. And, and, and to, to, to give you a bit of an idea, this is where I typically live in terms of activism. Uh, my sort of issues are uh, battery cages, sow stalls, farring crates, bobby calves, all that sort of thing. So I work at that, that, that interface of issues that people don't like um, uh, quite often. But um, in working through that, we've worked through how do we get insight about you know, what do consumers actually think about um, practices and, and how we, we have a discussion uh, with people in, in that environment. So we think things like this, like you know, could um, an apple be more fattening than a hot fudge sundae? All right? Yeah, could it be? And that? Someone went on to then say quite possibly, especially if you consider the exposure to accumulation of pesticides over the time in your body. So you're not only going to get cancer, you're going to get fat. All right? That was said by this lady, um, who's known as Food Babe. You can check her out on the, um, on the internet. She's a number one best um, um, seller. Time magazine said she's one of the 30 most influential people on the internet. Um, and I checked her out yesterday. She's got over a million likes on Facebook. And people pay her lots of money to espouse that type of view and a, a lot of other um, views that are probably of um, fairly similar uh, credibility and distaste to to um, the, the agricultural client base as well. So that's the view from the, from the other, other side and quite a strong um, view in the environment that we were working in. So these days there's this whole thing about food, you know, that, that's a, a discussion that we probably haven't seen before. And I'll talk a little bit about how that discussion around issues and particularly food and why agriculture is at the pointy end of, of, of that discussion. So when we're going shopping now, it's like there's two types of food in a supermarket now. It's either controversial, it's GM factory farmed, you know, chemicals or something like that, or it's controversy free, right? And the marketplace and retailers and brands and individual farmers and farm groups are trying to position themselves in those two categories or probably position themselves out of, of, of one of those, those categories. So I work a lot in the activism space and, and what's basically going on there is that we have people trying to, to separate farming and types of farming and, and what we do away from the, the um, rational majority that, that we would typically see as our, our client base over time. One of the key things we want to do is actually build trust in our products, right, through a labelling or our discussion and all that sort of stuff. Ultimately what we're trying to do is to build trust that ultimately we could actually add some value by being trusted to put some money in our, our back pocket. So I just want to look at what's happening to trust. What's the environment that we're now working in? What's actually changing? And this article came out in the um, early 80s. You go to YouTube, you can actually search for the year that shaped the generation. It explains this a lot better than I can. But it actually looks at what's, what's actually changing. Like, why is this getting so much um, harder? And 1968 may not actually be that particular year, but around that time a couple of things came together. Right? The Vietnam War and televisions turning up in people's lounge rooms. Right? It was one of the first times we actually saw, previous to that, the war was typically sanitised by the government. They put out the media releases, they had the journos um, on the front as well. The first time that the, um, the Vietnam was really the first time that people saw an independent view of the war in their lounge rooms. You know, in particular in the States, there was guys like Cronkite who were delivering the news every night. He left his desk and went to the front line and started delivering news. And it was one of the first issues that people felt that they could be involved in, that they could have a view on, and that they protested about. So even people not involved in the war started to protest. Whereas previously, typically up to that um, thing, a lot of the issues and stuff were a majority, if there was women's issues, women's protested. If there were black issues, black people protested. We didn't see a lot of white people protesting about black issues. 
and not a lot of men protesting about women's issues up until that date. So the Vietnam War was this really key point with change where people felt they could have a view about something. And we see that continuing today. People can have a view about how farmers operate even if they don't buy your, buy your um, um, product. 68, there was um, Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King got shot as well. So there was a few things. Then not long after that, we went to the moon. Right, and this photo was taken and this was really one of the fundamental pivots to the environmental movement because this was the first time we had a picture that this is the world. We only got one world. If we don't look after it, we don't have a spare. And that, so people started to really think about what we were, were, were doing. And then we started to see this progression of things that we'd held up as trustworthy start to break down. You know, um, and these are predominantly US examples, but you know, we had Nixon, we had Watergate, you know, the, the president of a country which is so highly regarded you know, started to fall. And then we had um, you know, um, Clinton um, in Australia, we had the Fitzgerald inquiry. So police and government and all these things that were once held up were really starting to fall um, below. One of the really key ones was things, with, particularly for agriculture, was like Three Mile Island nuclear power that scientists had once told us was really safe, suddenly wasn't. So when they tell us our, our beef's safe to eat, should we really trust those scientists? They got it wrong on, on um, nuclear power, are they telling us the right thing on food? And that starts an opening for anyone with an alternative view to, to start disbunking science. And then the army, and then Tiger Woods, and then this was a classic area. Remember when BP just happened to have a little bit of a leak in the Mexican Gulf? <laughs> the CEO, who was now the ex-CEO, very quickly ended his career by getting on the TV saying, look, I wish you sh this issue would just go away so I could get back to my family. You know, no regard for the environmental damage that they'd done or the, the, um, um, the impact on business and stuff in that place. So corporate is just not um, liked or loved at all. So if agriculture gets into that corporate sphere, it, it has problems to... to um, to, to start with. So it was this really pivotal um, change um, that happened about that time that we've actually seen progress since that time as to where we're, we're at at the, at the moment. And, and some of our systems just really haven't adjusted to that and I'll talk a little bit about, about that. You know, there's, there's four key things we talk about that have actually changed in that time that, that, that really should affect our thinking. The first one previous to that um, point in time, a lot of the authority was primarily granted by office. Right? The government made a decision, we followed it. Yeah, we'd, we'd have a discussion paper, we'd have a consultation with government, government would make a decision and then we'd go with the flow. Government was the arbiter of, of society. That's, that's now changed. And that authority is primarily um, granted by relationship. We don't listen to government, we listen to our peer group on Facebook and Twitter or the brands who we have a relationship with every week when we go and buy our groceries. So the brands have become the decision makers on a lot of things. All right? There's a full code review process for the egg industry that I work in. Um, and you know, they'll take three or four years. All right? McDonald's changes their egg position and gives their clients about 40 minutes notice. All right? That's the framework we work in, work in now because the brands have relationships with people and the extremists know if they attack the brands, there's no point attacking government because government usually doesn't care or government's no longer involved in the, in the process. Right? Broad social consensus driven by WASPs, which is an American term that I actually love they have a term for it. It's white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males, right? which <laughs> to be fairly blunt, Australian agriculture is full of them. <laughs> All right? um, Rural Women's Network, Rural Women's World is doing some great work, but You've still got a long way to go, unfortunately. Um, and I'm in that category, so I'm shooting myself a little bit. But now there's no single consensus, great diversity, and it's many voices, right? And particularly in brands, I reckon if you go to McDonald's, marketing section who made that decision, I reckon there'll be a lot of women, a lot of younger people, and a lot of people of mixed race in that space making decisions about agriculture don't take this personally, but a lot of our um, agricultural organisations are geared up to lobby government. Agriculture doesn't have a good relationship or processes to have a discussion with the brands. 
where our organisations are still geared up to lobby and talk to government, participate in consultations, write papers. They have policy departments right, that work on government policy when the rest of the world's dealing with brand decisions and, and all sorts of uh, things as well. Communications also has changed quite dramatically. Communications gone from being um, mass communication where everyone got the same message. All right? Everyone sat down around the TV, there was two or three news channels and everyone got the same news. All right? That's changed now that there's a mass of communicators. Everyone who's got a mobile phone can um, put something on Facebook, put it on Twitter, put it on Instagram, that sort of stuff. So there's lots and lots of news available and opinions and that sort of stuff. And the big thing that social media has done is create what we call tribes, right? You can actually pick who you get your information from. We're not all getting it from the same news story at 7.30 every night, right? I've bought the land, the agricultural paper in New South Wales once in the last two years, only because I was in it the week before and I wanted to see if I hadn't pissed anyone off in the letters to the editor and they don't put them on online, right? So people follow people who are like them. So we get the same view that suits us and quite often Facebook and Google will throw up stuff based on your past searches. So you keep getting the same message. So do you think those two groups probably follow each other on Facebook and follow the same groups of people, all right? Do you think either of those is likely to follow that bloke, all right? So we're not in the same space. We've got to work out how we get into those um, tribes, right? Which unfortunately for agriculture, we're trying to work out how to talk to government better when this whole discussion's going on around, around things and we need to work out how to get into that, that space. And potentially the question today is, is, is labelling one of those ways where you can deliver um, a message, yes or no? Last thing, progress back then was thought to be inevitable. We've just gone to the moon, we've had the green revolution and everything's wonderful, science is, is great. Now it's, you know, progress is possible. You know, if we do this, if we change that, you know, will greenhouse gas get worse, right? The whole thing, there's a whole different complexity about what's going on and the, the negative side can actually come into that argument a lot more um, now. So when we have an issue now, you know, it's often between the farmer, the grocer, the NGOs, RSPCA, World Wildlife Fund or whatever. But then there's this whole social media. Everyone can have a crack at it, can pass comment, can add something rightly or wrongly into that discussion. And government may or may not be involved in that, that process. You know, big changes in the industries I work in like, you know, sow stalls. You know, we'd already had the government process and stuff, which wasn't probably a bad outcome. But then this whole process actually changed to a voluntary system, which the government had nothing to, 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 do, to do with. So that dynamic is actually changing quite rapidly and quite, quite quickly. All right. So what we want in our, our farm situation is we actually want the freedom to operate, keep doing what we're, we're doing. That's why we use the social licence concept. A social licence is basically the privilege of operating with a minimal formalised restriction. So you can keep doing what you're doing until someone doesn't like it, then they'll ask the government to, to stop you doing it. Vegetation laws, animal welfare laws, that sort of stuff. Or now they will ask the brands to stop you doing it. They'll ask Coles and Woolworths to have a standard to stop you doing something. Same process, just different mechanism. And that trust is a belief that activities are consistent with the social expectations and the values of the, the community and stakeholders. So if I keep doing what they find acceptable, they'll let me do it. It's not a farmer thing. The best example I can find is dog owners. Dog owners have lost their social licence. They poop too much on the street, so the council said, you have to control that. Now they bred too many dogs, so now there's a penalty. You have to pay a higher um, registration fee for entire dogs and that sort of stuff. So this is how society operates. It's not a licence to farm. It's not being up farmers. This is just the way society um, functions and the society that we have to, to operate in, all right? And this is not warm and fuzzy feel-good stuff. This is commercial self-interest, right? Once we lose our social licence and we tip over, 
And then we're talking regulation, then we're talking certification, we're talking nutrient management plans, vegetation plans, compulsory audits, penalties over here in the UK, they play for real on this sort of stuff. That once that balance tips over, it costs you money. So maintaining social licences is, is, is a bottom line thing. So that's about why I talked about trust. Getting trust is a key for social licence. So three things, this is based on research, that impact on your social licence. The first is confidence um, and that. And is that, do you have the same values as your consumer? If I'm the consumer, do I believe you're the type of farmer who will look after your animals? If I don't think so, I will ask someone to stop you doing it and regulate that, that practice. Whether it's you know, battery cages, sow stalls, castration without anaesthetic, dehorning without anaesthetic, it'll get to the point, if I don't like it enough, I'll be asking someone to, to stop you. The next thing is competence. Do you have the ability to do that job? And the last thing is influential others. They're your peer group. There's people in your peer group who you respect to talk about particular things. You discuss football with some people and you'll discuss your financial future with other peers because you respect them in that area. And then we have credentialed others like academics, veterinarians, doctors and stuff who the community generally thinks are good um, as well. Big question is which of the two first ones is most important? Is it shared values or is it skills? Is it more important to show that you can do it or that you're the right type of person? Research shows us that it's three to five times more important to show people that you've got the right sort of values that you can actually do the job. All right? That's the fundamental problem for agriculture. Because right? our communities are asking us, should you do something? Should you castrate an animal without anaesthetic? All right? Our typical response is, yes we can, because the science says we can. So the community is asking us should questions and we give them can answers. So, yeah, and then when they don't like the answer we give them, what are we going to do? Hey? With what? More science. And when they don't get it, what do we do? We use more science until either we run out of science or we just work out that they're idiots and we don't want to talk to them anymore, is the, the, the sort of attitude. So we've been asked, they've been asking us should questions, we've been giving them can answers. All right. All right. So here's an example. I work in battery cages, sow stalls, all that sort of stuff. Why should we have those things? Because where I come from, 20% of kids grow up in poverty. Let's forget feeding the world in 2050 and all that crap I hear. Two million people in Australia rely on food support every year. We need low cost, high production systems. We also need niche market systems so lower volume people can make money. We need all the systems. But at the end of the day, go to the 20% of kids in my town and tell them they can't have cheap food anymore. Then you can have a discussion with me about whether my systems aren't any good. Right? No science in that. That's why we should be doing what we're, we're doing. It's not a can answer. I can tell you about cortisone levels and you know, the whole bit about the science of welfare, but it's not going to convince anyone. So we need a sustainable balance. We need to talk about our values and be ethically grounded. But we still have to do what's scientifically verified. We need to talk about our values so people listen to the science. We also then have to be economically viable. Right, we're not going to make it warm and fuzzy through labelling systems or discussions and that sort of thing. All right? But if we, have, if we show we have the right values, people's ears pop out and then they listen to the economics and the science. So that's our sustainable system. These things are based on knowledge, all right? Ethics is based on feelings and belief, all right? Now that's my world. You want to get a group of people in touch with their feelings and belief, and you want to start out somewhere simple, start with farmers, all right? Because we're so used to dealing with, with science. Key bit of research, and I've, I've heard this a couple of times about farmers being trusted. People trust farmers, but they're just not sure what you're doing anymore is farming. And we see that by the detractors as well. So farmers are trusted. As Soon as we ask questions about, if you see something bad about agriculture, would you trust a farmer to talk to you about that? Drops right off the scale, right? So they trust farmers, they just don't trust what you're doing is, is farming anymore. So agriculture has changed, 
but our key message has always got to be is that our commitment to doing what's right has never been stronger. People like changes in technology and everything, but how their food's produced. We really have to focus in on this message about what our values is, and most of the farmers I deal with, that statement is true. We just don't talk about it. We defend ourselves with science, as, as Dougal said. So transparency is no longer optional in what we do. People, look, yeah, yeah, everyone's got a camera on their phone now. If you're not talking about it, someone will be. Someone will show what's involved with castration, battery cages, that sort of thing. All right. Last thing, but sales are up. We've never sold more beef, more eggs, more pork, more milk and all that sort of stuff and agriculture has never been under any more pressure than it has before. Key thing is people who buy your product aren't necessarily the people who control how your industry operates. Right? Activist vegan groups that are impacting most of the industries I work with probably aren't a big market segment for what we do but they control how we produce it. So a really key thing to look at is the story of agriculture is always going to be told. Right? It's up to agriculture to decide who tells that. Yeah? Do farmers and people who work in the industry want to talk about that or do we want to leave a gap that the extremists and people with alternative views can, can plug? That's me. So thanks for the opportunity and I'll hand back to Ian. <laughs>